Blue-Eyed Serial Killer, Ted Bundy's Real Story. Wavy brown hair, big charming smile, and overall nice guy demeanor. Those who knew Ted Bundy thought it was impossible for him to hurt a fly. But behind this facade hid a depraved, sadistic, and terrifying killer. Our son is the best son in the world. With a shaky voice, Eleanor Cowell proclaimed these words when she was interviewed about her son Ted in the 80s. 22 and unmarried, she gave birth to a baby boy at Elizabeth Lund Home for Unwed Mothers in Burlington, Vermont on November 24, 1946. Days later, she went home, leaving the boy in the facility. But her father, Samuel, picked up the infant shortly after and took him home. Both Samuel and his wife, Eleanor, were devout Methodists and were ashamed of having their daughter impregnated out of wedlock. To hide this shame, they officially adopted Theodore Robert Cowell, and the boy grew up believing his grandparents were his parents and his true mother as his sister. At three years old, Theodore moved to Tacoma, Washington with his real mother. It was here she met Johnny Bundy, a cook. The two fell in love and married, having four children together. Johnny formally adopted Theodore, and since then, the little boy was known as Ted Bundy. My name is Ted Bundy. High school life for Ted differed depending on his recounting of events. In interviews, he said he roamed around the neighborhood picking up nudie magazines from trash bins. He also said he often read detective magazines with gruesome or illustrated images depicting sexual violence. Other times, he said he would canvass the community and peep through any open window trying to observe women undressing or see whatever he could see. He claimed he chose to be alone because he didn't understand interpersonal relationships and had no sense of how to develop friendships. The classmates at Woodrow Wilson High School said Bundy was well-known and well-liked. Some even said he was a medium fish in a large pond. But the medium fish did get into trouble in his high school years. He was arrested twice on suspicion of burglary and auto theft, but his records were ultimately expunged since he was a minor. College life for Bundy was more successful, and his charm and good looks won over University of Washington classmate Stephanie Brooks. Stephanie was wealthy, beautiful, and came from a prominent family, everything Ted wanted in his own life. For a time, Bundy volunteered at various Republican conventions and political meetings to be closer to and impress the young woman. But despite this, Brooks grew tired of Bundy's immaturity and lack of ambition, which ultimately led to her breaking up with him. He was devastated, and attempting to heal his broken heart, he took some trips to Colorado, Arkansas, and Philadelphia to visit relatives. It's here he found out that his sister was actually his mother, and that his parents were really his grandparents. Many say this was a pivotal point in Ted's life, because after this, he would never be the same again. He returned to Washington, now with renewed focus, and re-enrolled at the University of Washington, taking psychology as his major. His professors there thought highly of him, and it was here that he met Elizabeth Klopfer, a University of Washington secretary. She would go on to become Ted's long-term girlfriend. After graduating in 1972, Bundy became a part of the Republican Governor Daniel J. Evans' re-election campaign. Evans and his staff were so impressed with his work, he became an assistant to Ross Davis, the chairman of the Washington State Republican Party. Bundy was on the high road to success and decided to apply for law school at the University of Washington and the University of Utah. He did poorly on the entrance exams, but, armed with recommendations from Davis, he was accepted into both universities. While working for Ross, Bundy visited California and rekindled his relationship with Stephanie Brooks while still maintaining his relationship with Clover on the side. Brooks was impressed at Bundy's transformation, and she became enamored with him again. They discussed marriage. He proposed and she accepted. But in January of 1974, Bundy abruptly dropped contact with Brooks altogether. When she demanded an explanation, he simply said, Stephanie, I have no idea what you mean, and hung up the phone. Looking back, she realized Bundy had planned the courtship and rejection as vengeance for her breaking up with him in the first place. I just like to kill. I wanted to kill. 18-year-old dancer and university student Karen Sparks retired to her basement apartment bedroom for the night on January 4, 1974. 
That same night, a man snuck into her bedroom and bludgeoned her unconscious using a metal bed frame. After this, he assaulted Sparks using the metal bar, causing her serious internal injuries. Sparks survived, but was left in a coma for 10 days and has continued to live with horrendous permanent disabilities. On February 1st, Linda Healy disappeared from her bedroom. She was a beautiful undergraduate student and a broadcaster for the school's morning radio weather report. Police believe she was knocked unconscious, dressed, and carried out to the car. However, she was never seen again. One by one now, female college students began vanishing at a rate of one per month. Donna Manson disappeared on March 12th on her way to attend a jazz concert. On April 17th, Susan Raincourt vanished on her way to her dorm room. Then on May 6th, Roberta Parks left her dormitory for a coffee day with friends, but she never arrived. Detectives were frustrated because they couldn't find any strong suspects and the women continued disappearing. In June, two college students disappeared. Brenda Ball, who was 22, was leaving the Flame Tavern in Buren when she was last seen talking to a brown-haired man with an arm sling. Two weeks later, Georgian Hawkins, a UW student, vanished in a brightly lit alley. When police released Hawkins' disappearance, witnesses came forward saying they saw a man in crutches and a leg cast struggling to carry his briefcase. At least one woman remembered being asked by the man to help him carry books to a light brown Volkswagen Beetle. Although fear gripped the city, police were at a loss on where to look for a suspect. All they had was bits and pieces, that is, until July 14, 1974. On a crowded beach at Lake Sammamish State Park, two young women disappeared. They were Janice Ott, who was 23, and 19-year-old Denise Marie. Five other females then came forward saying they were approached by a handsome young man in an arm sling asking to help him unload his sailboat from a tan Volkswagen Beetle. Four women refused while one accompanied him to the car, saw no sailboat, and ran away. Three more women saw the man approach Janice Ott and heard him introduce himself as Ted. Soon after the incident, Bundy knew he needed to get out of Washington State, so in August, he moved to Salt Lake City where he studied law at the University of Utah Law School. But he hit a stumbling block in his studies, realizing he wasn't smart enough to grasp law at all. Just a month later, women around Utah began disappearing. On October 18th, Melissa Smith, who was 17, the daughter of a police chief from Midvale, a suburb of Salt Lake City, vanished. Her nude body was found nine days later in a mountainous area. Police believe she was kept alive for seven days before being killed. At the end of the month, another 17-year-old was taken, Laura Aim, when she left a cafe shortly after midnight. Both women were raped, beaten, sodomized, then strangled using nylon socks. Officer Roseland of the Murray Police Department On November 8th, 18-year-old Carol Durange headed to the Fashion Place Mall in Murray. Once inside, she was approached by a man who introduced himself as Officer Roseland, and he told her someone had attempted to break into her car. She was skeptical, but followed the officer to the parking lot. She could see nothing was wrong, but the officer then asked if she could accompany him to the police station to file a report. She agreed, got in his Volkswagen Beetle, and shortly after noticed they were driving on a different road than towards the station. When she pointed it out, the officer immediately placed a handcuff on her. A struggle ensued, and Durant managed to get out of the car and make a run for her life to a vehicle that was driving past. She survived, but later that night, 17-year-old Debbie Kent disappeared. By November, Elizabeth Klopfer, who was still in a relationship with Bundy, called police to tell them about her suspicion that her boyfriend was a killer. But the witnesses from the Lake Sammamish incident weren't able to identify Ted in a lineup, so police were unsure. Plus, there was no direct evidence linking him to any of the crimes. Bundy decided to move his operation to Colorado then in 1975. Registered nurse Karen Campbell was staying at a lodge with her fiancé when she went up to her hotel room in search of a magazine. She boarded the elevator and was never seen again. An extensive search was done, but her body wasn't discovered until a month later on a dirt road not far from the lodge. Two other women were killed in the area. Then in Idaho, Bundy took 12-year-old Lynette Culver, drowned her, and then assaulted her body in his hotel room before dumping her. 
With a rash of disappearances, police in various states were already on high alert. On August 16, 1975, Highway Patrol Officer Bob Haywards noticed a Volkswagen Beetle cruising the neighborhood without its lights on. The officer signaled for the vehicle to stop, but it sped up and the officer gave chase. Finally, the vehicle was caught and the officer searched inside and it was here he made a chilling discovery. Inside, the passenger's seat had been taken out and moved to the back. He also found a ski mask, a second mask made from pantyhose, rope, ice pick, trash bags, handcuffs, and items that could be used for burglary. The man tried to explain away the items, but the officer remembered details of a possible suspect in the Durant attempted kidnapping case and took him in. They searched his apartment, where they found brochures of Colorado ski resorts and other circumstantial evidence. On October 2nd, Durant identified the man, Ted Bundy, as Officer Roseland, and the case went to trial. Lead investigators from Utah, Washington, and Colorado met up for the first time and exchanged notes about the series of disappearances in each state. They walked away convinced it was Bundy who killed all the women, but they needed to find harder evidence. Bundy was found guilty in the Durant case and sentenced to a minimum of 1 to 15 years in prison. Bundy was charged with first-degree murder by Colorado officers for the death of nurse Karen Campbell. He agreed to be extradited to Colorado, thinking he would have better chances there of getting out of his trouble since he decided to represent himself in the case. Because he was his own lawyer, he didn't wear shackles or handcuffs, and during a court recess, he asked to visit the courthouse library. While the guard went out for a smoke, Bundy opened the window, saw the blue sky, and jumped out. He sprained his ankle when landing but moved forward, managing to evade law enforcement and eventual search parties for six whole days. He was caught though, but instead of waiting out the result of his case, which was weak at best, he hatched another plan to escape. On December 30th, while most guards were off for the New Year's holiday, Bundy maneuvered out of a crawl space, broke into the jailer's apartment, took a uniform, and then simply walked out of the front door. It would take 17 hours for the jailers just to find out he had escaped, and by this time, Bundy was already in Chicago. From there, he traveled to Florida. Once in Florida, he took up the name Chris Hagen, initially resolving to keep himself under the radar and finding a legitimate job. But when he tried applying, he was asked for identification, which he didn't have, so he went back to stealing and burglary instead. On January 15, 1975, Bundy entered the back door of the Chai Omega sorority house in Florida. Around 3 a.m., he began bludgeoning, killing, and assaulting four women from the home, Margaret Bowman, Lisa Levy, Kathy Kleiner, and Karen Chandler. The attack lasted approximately 15 minutes, and Bowman and Levy died from their injuries. All of the girls were heavily disfigured from the attack. Levy was assaulted and had bite marks on her body. Bundy then left the house and headed to another apartment, that of Cheryl Thomas, leaving her bludgeoned and permanently deaf. Three weeks later, he abducted a 12-year-old girl named Kimberly Leach. Her body would turn up a few weeks later. I wish you had killed me. On February 12th, Bundy stole a car and tried to move westward. At 1 a.m., he was flagged down by Officer David Lee close to the Alabama state line. The license plate on the vehicle came back stolen and when Bundy realized he was being arrested, a fight ensued as he tried to get away. Eventually, the officer managed to tackle Bundy and arrest him. Inside the vehicle, the officer found sets of IDs belonging to female Florida State University students, including credit cards and plaid slacks and glasses, a disguise he used to lure victims. During his trial, Bundy's team initially thought of accepting a plea bargain, but at the last minute, Bundy changed his mind because he realized he would have to admit guilt in front of the world, something he didn't want to do. By the end of the first trial for the sorority house murders, he was found guilty and given a death sentence. After six months, he appeared in court again for the murder and abduction of Kimberly Leach. During the trial, ever the showman, Bundy took advantage of an obscure Florida law that states when a marriage declaration is done in court in the presence of a judge, it would be considered a legal marriage. During this second trial, Carol Boone, one of Bundy's longtime girlfriends, 
appeared as a character witness. It was here he asked Boone to marry him and she agreed. He then declared they were married. Boone later got pregnant and proclaimed it was Bundy's child. For this second trial, he was also found guilty and sentenced to death via electrocution. In the days leading up to his execution, despite his best delaying tactics, he knew he was eventually going to die. He decided to tell officers about other murders, hinting at many more victims that they didn't know about. There were some killings he confessed to, but others he kept to himself until the end. On January 24, 1989, Ted Bundy was killed via electric chair at 42 years old. His last words before heading in were, I'd like you to give my love to my family and friends. He left behind a wake of approximately 30 women dead, but many say his victims could be as high as 100. We have new videos coming out every Wednesday and Saturday, so please remember to subscribe to our channel because you won't want to miss out on what's coming up next. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you soon.